There's a new study that has come out about uh, how unions uh, affect racial prejudice among white workers. Uh, so, Paul, what did they find? Yeah, so this was a study by the um, American Journal of Political Science um, out of Princeton, I believe, um, conducted the study trying to measure, you know, how do unions affect the racial attitudes of white workers? And so what they did in the study is they developed a scale of, they call it a scale of racial resentment. And what they did, they got respondents, a mix of white union members and non-union members to respond to a series of statements on a scale that goes from strongly disagree to strongly agree. So for example, one statement was, quote, the Irish, Italians, Jews, and many other minorities overcame prejudice and worked their way up. Blacks should do the same without any special favors. So the respondent would mark, do they strongly disagree or strongly agree? Another statement, for example, was generations of slavery and discrimination have created conditions that make it difficult for Blacks to work their way out of the lower class. And again, they would mark, do they agree, strongly agree, disagree, strongly disagree. And so it would take kind of too long for me to fully explain in detail how this study was conducted and measured. So I highly suggest people read the study if you're a little skeptical and maybe we can link it in the show notes. But here was um, some of the conclusions that they reached. So they said, um, white union members are less racially resentful than non-union members by between 4.7 and 6.3% of the racial resentment scale. The magnitude of this relationship is substantial, rivaling or surpassing other democratic other demographic variables and that strongly structure mass politics in the United States. Past union membership is also significantly associated with reduced racial resentment. Past union members are less racially resentful by between two and 2.5% of the range of the index. The authors of the study also speculated on why. Why are unions today are able to have this effect on white workers? And so they concluded that there were certain structural factors that create this situation in unions. So it said union leaders, because of the need to recruit workers of color in order to, to achieve majority memberships in racially diversifying labor sectors, have ideological and strategic incentives to mitigate racial resentment among the rank and file in pursuit of organizational maintenance and growth. And so if all of this is true, the decline or growth of unions has huge implications for a contemporary political and social life. And so the study goes on to say, as a conclusion, taken together, the results point to the importance of unions for influencing the racial attitudes of its members, and more broadly for the development of civil rights policies. This influence also points to a major consequence of union decline in the modern era. As a critical organization associated with promoting racial toleration weakens in organizational reach, its relative influence over political outcomes and the formation of sociocultural identities particularly within the white working class, will likely continue to weaken with it. So these conclusions really shouldn't be surprising, and they are consistent with a lot of labor history. In the 1930s and 40s, during the heyday of the, the CIO, the Congress of Industrial Organizations, which was a new left-wing uh, labor federation, um, in the South, labor organizing was often synonymous with civil rights and racial integration. Uh, many CIO unions were known for bringing diverse memberships together through social events like dances, picnics, sports events. And this work not only won strong contracts for all the unionized workers, but it helped to break down the individual prejudices of white members. And so I want to look at one example specifically with the Packing House Workers of America, uh, which was a union representing meat packing workers. Um, that, and they did some of the best organizing on racial justice in the workplace. And a lot of times these packing house workers would have black workers, uh, Scandinavian, um, Irish, Eastern European, German, I mean, all types of ethnicities within the workplace. Um, and this example, I think, points to the structural factors that were referenced in the study that push white workers and unions to be more likely to challenge their own prejudices. Um, so, you know, during World War I, there was an organizing drive among the packing house workers that was beaten back by racial division. Black workers weren't allowed in the union, so the employers then used black workers as strike breakers. So when another organizing drive gained momentum in the 1930s, many workers had learned a lesson. So here's a quote from a white packing house worker talking about the organizing drive in the uh, 30s. He said, they, meaning the white workers, they didn't come in and hug him and kiss him, but they knew they had to be together, period. Even though some of them were anti-Negro, they still knew you had to be together to form a union and to win some of their demands. 
And so on the other hand, many black workers drew a similar conclusion, even though they had much more reason to be skeptical of interracial organizing given the past. So one quote here from Phil, Philip Waitman, who was a black uh, shop steward at a uh, plant in Chicago. So he said, we cannot cater to whites and we cannot cater to the blacks. This is the principle on which the union is organized. No second class citizenship. We never met with a black group or a white group. It was always bringing together. By consistently stressing the material benefits the union was winning, they were able to convince some hesitant white workers to support the multiracial union. Many packing house workers called this that they had a religion of unity. And so what's so interesting to me about this is that the un union did not set out to change the, the hearts and minds of white workers. They started with the pragmatic assessment of what could win them the strongest contract. But if you follow the same union over time, the work that they did actually wound up changing the hearts and minds of many white workers. And many white workers a few years later were doing sit-ins with fellow black coworkers to desegregate local restaurants or bars or whatever, whatever it was. Um, and so lastly, I'll add that unions are a unique site, a potential unique site of political education for working people. Not many other institutions offer this. And many locals do political education on racial inequality specifically. And again, this is also not new. Um, unions were one of the only institutions during the Jim Crow era to educate white working class people about how racism divides working people. And so I wanted you to take a look at this, um, a clip from a very interesting video that was put together by the United Auto Workers Education Department in 1946 called The Brotherhood of Man. Well, it isn't the size of a brain that counts, it's what it can do. And their tests have shown that our three average men are equal. If you take their skins off, there's no way to tell them apart. The heart, liver, lungs, blood, everything's the same. Uh, everything's the same. Heart, liver, lungs, blood. <laughs> No, not blood. Blood's different. Well, there are four different types of blood. A, B, AB, and O. Patient in room 216 needs a transfusion right away. I'll give it to him. I'm his brother. Stanley! He's dead! Yes, but he wouldn't be if we'd been more scientific about it. Brother or no brother, what he needs is type A. And the right blood donor for him could belong to any race, since the four blood types appear in all races. Say, hey, we're not really so different at all. Like you say, it's, it's just the frills. <laughs> Only, wait a minute. I, I got a question. How come we live like this? And, uh... It wasn't always that way. For instance, at a stage of history when the so-called pure whites of Northern Europe were little better than savages, the darker-skinned mixed peoples of the Near East and Africa had flourishing cultures. And the great civilization of Northern China had begun to develop. All peoples contributed to civilization, reaching high levels at different times, and each learning from the experience of the other. So just think about that was 1946. Think about a white worker in 1946. If they were not in the, a union and getting that message, where would they get that message? And the reality is they probably wouldn't get that message. Um, and I think the same goes for today. Without unions, many workers may only get exposed to an explanation of why their life is bad, that scapegoats immigrants and people of color. With a union, there's a possibility that their anger can be focused on who the real enemy is, which is the corporate class, the capitalist class. Um, so I'm really glad that study was put out. I think you know it really highlights Unions, again, it's not just about workers making more money. Like it is a very 
important part of our civil society that affects you know all levels of society and all kinds of issues. Um, so Jen, I'm curious your thoughts on that. Yeah, um, I, I love that study because, you know, when you read it, uh, I think to us, it's kind of like, oh, duh, you know, or like, oh, well, like you're kind of stating the obvious. Uh, but I also want to point out, um, uh, I mean, A, it's good to have it empirically <laughs> on paper, right? Um, and B, you know, I have complained on this show before about the kind of top down anti-racism training that comes from like HR departments and diversity consultants and Robin D'Angelo and so on and so forth. Um, and the overwhelming, the the literature on that type of training, like, you know, HR mandated uh, required diversity training in corporate settings the, the consensus is overwhelmingly that it doesn't work to reduce people's biases. Um, it doesn't, you know, diminish people's feelings of prejudice. Uh, and also it, you know, doesn't increase diversity in the workplace. Uh, so the, the consensus is that it doesn't work, like I said. Um, but I think what I talk about less on this show is the same researchers who are basically like that type of implicit bias training doesn't work are when they're asked about what kinds of uh, initiatives work to reduce workplace prejudice, they always come back to the same thing, which is that you have to get people like working together toward a common right. goal, which sounds like totally corny, but like it's true. And they don't s explicitly say like you need to put people in a union, but that's exactly what a union does. So I think that, you know, that's just another way in which the study totally makes sense to me. Yeah. And I love those quotes from the white and the black worker because the white worker, I mean, it was just straight up. All right. I'm going to keep my racist thoughts to myself right. for purposes of this union. But, you know, in the process, at least that gives them a chance to be like, hey, actually, mm -hmm. in my, you know, I'm now experiencing that maybe my fucked up thoughts are not right. not reality. And that for many people, it did. For some people, it didn't. But I think that's the best chance that we have. Right. I, I think that UAW cartoon also is amazing. Like when you first showed that to me a while ago, like, you know, I feel like I know a little bit about labor history, but I was like, oh, my God, like I've never seen that before. Yeah. Um, and calling, I think that what's calling that? White people calling white people savages. And I know that, ca wow. that caveman caricature, um, <laughs> <laughs> that video might be canceled today, but I right. thought it was great. <laughs> Yeah. Um, you know, I think there is a tendency uh, now among liberals, but among the left as well, to have to always couch our support for the labor movement and for unions in kind of or also say like, well, we know unions used to be racist or like we know unions aren't perfect. And honestly, like. Of course, that's still true, but I mean, to look at that cartoon, uh, and you know, there are many other examples from labor history. I mean, I think that unions actually like played an important role, as you say, in reducing, uh, you know, workers' prejudice, not just in right. this empirical study that you've been talking about, but at, you know, we have we have examples from history as well. Um, and right. and I guess finally, I want to say, you know, this idea that like through working together for a common goal to a common goal uh, that you that that is the process that can start moving people's hearts and minds like that's just a classic materialist explanation of how you change people right i mean the kind of liberal understanding is oh well you have to like do these anti-racism trainings or like people have to like get woke before they can start working together because you know anti-racism is or i mean sorry racism is so ingrained in everybody that you really have to work you really have to do the self-work before you can actually be part of a movement um but i mean and I just want to remind everybody, Jacobin viewers probably don't need reminding, but there is another option, which is that, you know, uh, if you change the material conditions, aka if you work if through the struggle of changing the material conditions, you might also change some hearts and minds.